Marshall and Sagar here. Welcome back to The Realignment. Hey everyone, welcome back to the show. Sagar and I are so pumped to show you this episode today. We spoke with Mark Andreessen, the co-founder of Andreessen Horowitz, an incredibly prominent venture capital firm, the co-founder of Netscape, and of course, the co-creator of Mosaic, which was the first widely adopted consumer internet browser in the early 1990s. Mark has really wide interests, as do we, of course. So we hit so many different topics. It's going to be hard to sum up this episode in one tight, easy title. So of course, we're going with the simple Mark Andreessen on pretty much everything. Of course, if you have a better suggestion, definitely reply in the comments below. I read those comments. I will check and I will update this title if there's something a little more creative than this very obvious one. So hope you enjoyed this episode. If you're new to the show, would love for you to hit subscribe below as well too. Hope you enjoyed this conversation. Mark Andreessen, welcome to The Realignment. Hey, good morning, guys. Hey, good morning, Mark. Good morning. I'm excited because we could start on a topic of deep mutual interest. I was listening to you on Tyler Cowen's podcast, and you were talking about how you were deeply interested in the period from 1880 until basically like the 1910s. This is the second industrial revolution. Sagar and I have our whole bit on this, but I'd love for you just to go first. Like, What makes that a particularly relevant area? to study right now. Yeah, so it's a it's a time it, it really gets slandered, I think. It just gets gets kind of written off as like robber barons and like just all this like evil capitalism happening and then it gets written off as like the sort of last vestige of the sort of 19th century dark ages that you know kind of all the all the FDR reforms came out of and so forth. But like it was really interesting and i mean it, you know the big thing you have to just highlight right up front is it's just like so much of we can of what we consider modern life got built out then right uh, and and in particular you know i spent a lot of my life working on computer networks um of different kinds you know in, in that era they built out all the real world networks and so they built out you know everything they built out the you know first the the railroad network and then the telegraph network and then the telephone network and then and then radio networks and then ultimately you know the interstate you know the road network and the interstate highway network you know kind of came out of that and then electrification right you know came out of that and so you had this period which was you know very modern right in a lot of ways i mean you know sort of cla in the classical definition of modern which is like modernity kind of fully expressing itself but also in kind of the colloquial version of modern which is you know the modern world that we live in um and these were you know these were these you know great books have been written about this but these were gigantic efforts i mean to get the <laughs> to <laughs> to build the railroads like that you know that was that that was heavy lifting and so you, you had these entrepreneurs Right. You know, and this was during this kind of convergence point. The other interesting thing is in this kind of convergence point between the older model of bourgeois capitalism, right, and then the, the sort of newer model of managerial capitalism, you know, which, which we could talk about. Um, but, um, you know, sort of the combination of the two, because you had these like, you had the railroad barons, right? You had these guys, you know, a, a great example, by the way, Leland Stanford, who's the founder of Stanford University, yep. which is, you know, kind of the origin point of half the stuff that we do today. Right. Um, you know, he, he was one of the sort of railroad barons. Um, and so one of one of these kind of old school, hard charging, you know, kind of sole proprietor, like I'm going to build this giant thing just, you know, through sheer will. But at the same time, you know, they, they needed scale. So they needed, you know, access to a scaled financial system. And then you had the role of J.P. Morgan during that era. Right. And then and then and then J.P. Morgan actually was really interesting. He was more interesting than people think. Um, you know, he, he, JP Morgan is a very interesting firm back at that time. Um, because, because it was, it was a twin firm. There was a fa father and son and the father was actually in London. The father was Junius Morgan. And then the son mm -hmm. was J Pierpont Morgan, who was in, in New York. And basically the purpose of the Morgan banks, and then there was a, another affiliated bank uh, called Drexel. And the, the, the purpose of the banks was to basically move the accumulated wealth of the British empire, uh, which had become a slow growth place to invest. The UK had become, and Europe, continental Europe were becoming slow growth places to invest. And it was to basically move that wealth and invest it in the new world and invest it in the United States. Um, and so it was this sort of mass diversion of capital into a place, the United States, that could actually use it and could actually build out these giant things. And so you had this just incredible pairing of sort of these great industrial barons with this kind of great kind of financial, you know, kind of adventure, uh, you know, that happened. And, and then it worked, right? Like we, we, we got the modern United States out of it. And, you know, to this day, right, we're still, we're still, we are still, you know, basically living in, 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 in you know, to a large extent on the work that uh, of, of the people of, of that generation, you know, 100, 120 years ago. Absolutely. Mark, what do you think, in what ways does that time period rhyme with 
work today. So one of the ways that we focused on here is that the 1890s were an age of acrimony. We had massive levels of political participation, but it also is characterized and thought of today as an area of political stagnation. While you had a dual track of an incredible amount of innovation that was happening on the societal level. Do you think that that is the same case as where we are right now with technological innovation, political stagnation, and how do those things converge um, in the future, if we were to look at it through today's heuristic, well, so I, you know, look from a, from a, start with a bit from a business standpoint first, or sort of industrial kind of standpoint first. Um, you know, look the, the the work that's happened in the last thirty or forty years to build the internet and to build the digital networks. I think is I think you can draw a lot of comparisons to the yes. to the build out of the of the networks of that era. Um, you know, on the other hand, basically since the 1960s or 1970s, we have, you know, essentially outlawed the kind of industrial <laughs> development that happened during that period, right? Well, here's another thing that happened during that period. People were still starting cities. Like th right. there, were, entre there right. were entrepreneurial projects in the United States called cities. <laughs> they, they would like take a patch of land. The Los Angeles actually was a, was a sort of a great, a great example. It's a fascinating story how, how Los Angeles was created. Like, like Los Angeles in that era, Los Angeles like started out as the Theranos of cities. Like the, the <laughs> <laughs> these guys, you know, kind of went out to the West Coast and they took basically a patch of desert that had no water. Um, and then they basically ran these ads in the East Coast and, the, and, and in the ads, it was drawings of like paradise. It was like, you know, all these lush gardens and palm trees and like all this amazing stuff. And so people would literally buy these plots of land and then they would travel all the way out. You know, it was a big deal at the time to travel 3000 miles to get to get to California and they'd get out there and they'd have a patch of dirt. Right. And, but, right. And, and then, of course, you know, step two was, you know, they had to go get the water and, you know, that that was a whole adventure. And, you know, they made the movie. Yeah. Kind of thought about that. But like the result of it was Los Angeles, right? And there's like whatever 12 million, 15 million people now who live in the, you know, this this just like amazing city that these, you know, basically this group of people got together and just decided to will into existence. Um, and, and you know, Los Angeles was far from the only one. There were there were many, many others. And so you just go through like this idea, this idea that you're gonna like build out a transportation network or that you're gonna build, you know, a, a dam, right? And alter nature, or you're gonna build a completely different way to distribute water, or you're gonna build a new city. Like that stuff is basically all illegal now. Like for me, if you, nobody else finds this funny. I find it very funny. The infrastructure, right? Infrastructure bills. Like what, what, what are the two things we know in Washington that we need to, what are the two things that every politician knows? Our infrastructure is crumbling. Um, and then we're, we need to pass an infrastructure bill and build new infrastructure. And so they pass these bills, they allocate this money and nothing happens. Yeah. Nothing gets built. Like there are no new ports. Right? There's no new. Uh, there was just an article this week. The the one thing that I thought that they were going to build with this big new infrastructure bill was new chip plants. Like I thought that's the one thing everybody agreed on. And now there's this bill that the money's gotten hung up, and it looks I was like gonna say, that's that. a second bill actually, Mark. That's not. Oh, a new okay, all right. That hasn't even bill. happened yet. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, fine. Yeah. So the first bill was like a trillion dollars. It didn't. Yeah, yeah result no, I don't really know what's in it to be honest. Like, yes. where does that money go? Like it it doesn't show up in anything in the real world. So it goes yeah. somewhere. Um, I mean, I. I think we also kind of suspect where it goes. It goes in people's you know, bank accounts ultimately. But, um, you know, it, it, I mean, it's really funny when we accuse the third, you know, kind of the developing world of being corrupt. And then you just look at the sheer amount of money that gets diverted out of these programs here. It really kind of makes you wonder. But, um, yeah, look, like we basically made it illegal to build all these things. Um, and, you know, we've done that in a kind of very deliberate kind of comprehensive way. It, you know, it really kicked in in the 1970s. Uh, these things have basically been illegal ever since. Every, everything anybody attempts to build in the real world gets, you know, basically hung up in court. Uh, by the way, interesting correlation, the more desirable the location, like the more illegal it is, right? And so, like, mm -hmm. you, 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 you know, like you can build all the housing you want in a, in, a, in, a, in a city nobody wants to live in, and then you can't build any housing at all in the city that people want to go to, right? And so it's like we, we, we've somehow gotten, like, into complete the opposite land on these things. And so quick, we've decided as a society. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, quick, quick follow up because I, I love your comparison of LA's inception to Theranos because it gets at the difficulty of the moment. You've talked about how social media really exposes things. Obviously, if you went back to the 1910s with a Twitter equivalent, you couldn't have done LA because someone would have posted this is the equivalent of the Fire Festival sandwich. You would have had. Mm -hmm. Wait a second. I went out to LA and like there's just this patch of dirt that it would have gone viral. You would have had a documentary. It's all basically over. Think of how Texas was electrified or even just like going to Texas in the 1880s, 1890s. You're promised all this great stuff, but instead the clay doesn't work. This is the whole first book um, of Robert Caro's Lyndon Johnson series. So what do you think about the dilemma here of like bullshit? maybe being a good thing. And the fact that people can't bullshit sustainably for long terms, actually acting as a harm for progress. 
Yeah, so let me start by saying I'm not pro-fraud. <laughs> <laughs> I said bullshit. Put, That's the key thing. Put bullshit. My, yeah. Put my priors on the put my priors on the table. Yes. I, I am I am not pro-fraud. I'm not advocating for fraud. We spend a lot of time in our companies, you know, trying to make sure everybody understands, you know, kind of what the line is and not 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 to do anything. So um so I, I'm definitely not fraud. Like, look, having said that, uh, I, I guess I, you could use a different term, which is speculation, right? And and you could kind of say, okay, is speculation good or bad? And you know, there's just there's a lot of people, you know, kind of in our culture, a lot of people would say, well, speculation by definition is bad. And by the way, you see this in the press all the time. It's like if, if there's something new and then, the, you know, it has a stock price or whatever or, or an asset price, and that price goes up, then it's, you know, it's, I guess, speculation is working at the moment. And then if it goes down, it's like, aha, we knew this whole time that was speculation. That was bad. You know, kind of people got taken advantage of. I mean, this is this weird, you know, that's led to this weird dichotomy where the SEC, you know, is sort of has been, you know, for decades now, like really committed to protecting investors from themselves. Um, right where they, you know, where they, they you know, the SEC, you know, it's this really amazing thing where the, you know, uh, sort of everybody in light and government says we want to do anything we can to reduce, you know, wealth inequality, um, and then they literally have a two-tier investment system where only rich people can make the high return investments. Like o- yes. only rich people can invest in new quote unquote speculative areas, which are the areas that have the prospect for actual growth and therefore, you know, kind of outperformance. Um, and so we, you know, we have this kind of very deep level of, of unease with that. My favorite example of this, my favorite historical example is the um, the uh, Massachusetts state legislature in 1982 passed a law banning individual Massachusetts investors from investing in Apple stock um, in Apple's IPO. Um, I mean, and, and they said, look, like, you know, look, it's been 100 years of like stocks in the public and all this stuff. And we get it. But like this Apple computer thing is obviously like just speculation. This is obviously BS. <laughs> like, this obviously isn't going to go anywhere. And so we're going to draw the line here. Right. And not let our people buy Apple stock. And so. Yeah, there's this, there's this, and and you know we could, we could have a long discussion as to where this stuff comes from. I think there's like I think this is like the American Puritan streak. Like I think this might be another variation of this dynamic you see over the 400 years of American history, where it's like we've got this Puritan streak on the one hand that literally goes all the way back to the Mayflower, and then we've also got this adventurous streak, by the way, that also goes back to the Mayflower, which is you know, <laughs> so, you know Puritans get on the boat, you know, and come to the New World in 1620. Like you know they they were schizophrenic, right? Uh, you know, kind of in that way. Um, and so the Puritan streak keeps wanting to classify speculation as evil and bad. And then, and then speculation is uncertainty, right? Like, you know, the, sometimes new things work. Some, you know, some, some, sometimes they work, sometimes they don't, you know, when they work, it's kind of like, wow, that was kind of a fluke. Um, and then when they don't work, it's like, aha, see, we knew, right. That, you know, these were, you know, evil people taking advantage of people. Um, if you look at basically all of history, as I'm sure you guys have, is basically anything new was speculative, like yes. by definition, right? Because like, if, if it was new, that meant it hadn't been done before. If it hadn't been done before, nobody knew whether it was going to work. Somebody had to take a chance, right? And this is true of everything. This is true of like a tribe moving from one valley to another. This is true of like any, you know, anytime anybody's ever launched a war, any, anytime anybody's ever done anything interesting, uh, you know, there's been a level of risk involved. Um, and so, you know, anyway, that takes us back to our current time where, you know, for some reason, you know, at least at the moment, we're okay with digital risk. At, at the moment, we are very much not okay with what you might consider analog risk. And, you know, it's, it's gotten very kind of weird and disconnected. That's exactly what I wanted to pick up on because what I was really picking, you know, I've seen the critique always leveled. It's like, oh, these tech guys, like they'll invest, they talk a big game about wanting to build stuff in the real world, but they're funding X, Y, and Z, which is returning in the software business. What you're pointing to, and I think this is important for people who listen to the show, is that the architecture of regulation is actually directing where capital is going to go in order to seek the most return. So I've said, you know, if I had a billion dollars, like I would want to try and build a nuclear plant, but I'm also not stupid because I know that would actually not be possible to do under the Federal Nuclear Regulatory Commission. I also know that if I wanted to build a fertilizer plant, which I, again, would not be able to do so. I also would want to build an oil refinery, which we haven't been able to build since 1977. So could you address that as somebody who's quite literally an investor in the marketplace and how the underlying legal framework actually directs not only where you, but your LPs and the broader industry has to direct their money, which has broader social ramifications for all of us? Yeah, that's right. So there's a website uh, called WTF happened in 1971.com. Mm-hmm. Um, and it basically has like pages and pages and pages and pages of charts. And basically it, it shows a lot of things. But one of the things it shows is basically industrial stagnation hit hard in basically 1971. And, you know, for sure, by you know, kind of by the late 70s. Um, and, and basically like everything industrial sort of stagnated after that. And, and, and in a very starkly like different way than what happened basically before, 19, before 1971. Now, it so happens 1971 is the year I was born. Um, I, you know, oh. I, I, I'm hoping that that's you know, correlation, correlation, not causation. Um, you know, I do, I do. The first time somebody pointed this side out to me, I did, I did take it a little bit personally. Um, but, um, you know, it, something really kicked in there. 
Um, nuclear is a great example. So nuclear power, right, is, 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 if anything, it may be the most topical, you know, kind of issue of all, because now there's this, we're, we're in the full throes of the global energy crisis, right? You know, the, the global energy crisis really, com- you know, completely bears on foreign policy around Russia and the, and the Ukraine war. You know, the Europeans are on the front end of this, where, you know, they're now staring down the barrel of, a, of energy shortages that, you know, the, the German whatever energy minister came out, you know, this week and basically said, you know, boy, you know, I really hope that we don't need to do energy rationing, you know, in, in the winter, yep. which, which of course means Germany is going to have to do energy rationing yeah. and then the they're going to burn coal while doing it yeah and they're going to burn coal right they're shutting down the yeah. nuclear plants they're, they're firing yeah. up the coal plants and emissions are going to go through the roof and so and and in the meantime they're funding their hated enemy russia at you know to the tune of over a billion euros a day right to keep to keep the energy flowing and then you know to your point like basically like there's no like yeah the, we, we have, we're totally out of refinery capacity in the u.s i mean we can we can in theory we can go get more gas or get more oil but like we can't refine it so so yeah, so this is super topical. So then you go back to 1971. It's like, well, what the hell happened in 1971? It's like, well, Richard Nixon <laughs> had two very important kind of initiatives in 19 between basically 1970 and 1972. Um, initiative number one was he created the Environmental Protection Agency. Um, by the way, um, it is interesting. He doesn't seem to get any credit for that. Um, you know, from the people who you would think would be enthusiastic about that. But very you know, true. he was you know he was quite he was quite liberal on 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 the on, on questions of the environment. So he created the EPA, and then and, and then you know the EPA is symbolic of the process that we're going to talk about. And 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 it's and you know I should start by saying I'm not even really taking a stand here on like environmental protection, good or bad or whatever. It's just a legal regime was put in place to basically to they had the net result of basically blocking all new industrial development, um, and that was kind of the kickoff of, of that period. He did this other thing at the same time. He created this thing called Project Independence, and it was basically the goal. He anticipated the energy crisis in the 70s, and he said, we need to get energy independent. And so he said, let's build 1,000 new nuclear reactors um, in the United States by the year 2020, um, or by the year 2000. 1,000 new reactors by the year 2000. And he said, let's basically get energy uh, independent. And by the way, on on the form of clean energy that we actually know how to build, like we know how to build zero emission energy, we know how to protect the environment. Um, You know, nuclear is by far the safest, both human safest and environmentally safest form of energy that we know how to make. Um, And so let's build a thousand nuclear plants. Um, You probably know the answer to this question. How many new nuclear plants has the Nuclear Regulatory Commission authorized in the last 40 years? Uh, I believe zero. Zero. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. It's the Nuclear Prevention Commission. Like it, it, yeah. it the, 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 you see what I'm saying is that there was there was a clash at that time between these two visions. One vision of we're going to basically put in place a protective regime, which will have the effect. It may have positive effects, but it will have the effect of stopping industrial development. And then we're going to declare that we have these goals. You know, that was the infrastructure bill of its time. We're going to declare we have these goals of energy independence, and clean energy. And then, of course, the one is going to trump the other. Right. The, the, the one makes the other impossible. And, you know, he did both of those without resolving the contradiction. And nobody since has resolved the contradiction. And when you bring it up today, basically people just get mad. Um, yeah. And they're, you know, and they're, they're basically, there is no, like, I, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't, maybe it's overly pessimistic, but like, th- there's no, there's, there's no, at least I don't see it. I got, you know, barring some like very, very different kind of, uh, you know, kind of point of view of the, of, of the body politic. I don't, I don't see a way through this. Maybe what we need is just like some really, really bad crises. Like maybe we need a really bad energy crisis. Like maybe we need a really bad like conflict with Russia. Maybe we need people to get, you know, to get serious. Um, and so, you know, look, maybe we're, we're the preconditions are being laid right now to change this. But at least sitting here today, to your point, like even if I wanted to invest in nuclear, like I can't, you know, you're, you're pushing on you're pushing on a rope of all time. Like I have I'll give you another yeah. example. I have all these friends working on nuclear fusion. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, nuclear fission is splitting the atom. Nuclear fusion is fu- fusing and, and nuclear fusion in theory is even better. You know, it's a it's yes. it's, it, it's even better and cleaner and so forth. Um, like they're not going to let you build a nuclear fusion plant in the U S like they're not, they don't let you build a fission plant. They're not going to let you build a fusion plant. Like it's, it's, you know, maybe they can build one in China. I don't know, or Antarctica or somewhere, but it's not going to happen here. And so again, it's this thing where, you know, you're just, you're just like pushing on a rope and then, and then, and then, and then you get the results that you would expect from that. You know, Mark, something I'm curious about, because this is the perfect pivot. I did an episode with Ian Bremmer a few weeks back on the idea of crisis actually serving as a catalyst for change. You wrote your, big, it's not really big in terms of length, but it's big in terms of importance, time to build SA during the, towards the end of the the COVID lockdown in 2020. Why does it feel like the big cataclysmic change that you're describing and possibly serving as like a build move? Why did it feel like that didn't really happen? It seems that yeah. getting locked down for two months, if, if we take a step back, if we, let's say we record this in 2018, if you'd ask us what would be the biggest thing ever, I'd say it probably would be the first year of COVID. What do you think happened over the next two years that prevented that moment from capturing the zeitgeist? 
You know, it's, you know, like, I, I think it's basic human nature. You know, it's, it's Daniel Kahneman talks about type one versus type two reasoning. Mm-hmm. You know, type one is sort of emotional reasoning. Type two is logical reasoning. He actually talks about in the book how type two reasoning is actually physically arduous. <laughs> like it, it actually causes like your pulse to rise, your blood pressure to rise. Like it, it consumes more energy. Like it, it's hard, right? Um, Brian Kaplan, who wrote, he wrote a you know, great book called uh, the, the Myth of the Rational Voter, which is a great book. And he, he talks in the book about this idea. He talks about ration, he talks about rationality. And then he talks about there's this thing called ira- he's this rational irrational rationality. Um, and so he said, everybody's rational about the thing that's like right in front of them. So like, if I'm going down the flight of, a flight of stairs, like I'm very rational about where I put my feet because like I have an immediate feedback loop to the consequences of making an irrational decision. And I like concentrate hard on that. But if I'm thinking about some big abstract political topic, like energy policy, right? Like, you know, like the typical, by the way, even me, it's not like I'm an expert on energy and it's like, okay, like how much of the rest of my life am I going to spend becoming an expert on, on energy, right? As sort of the marginal voter. Um, and how much effort am I going to be willing to put into that? And so, you know, it would be irrational for me to become rational about it. And so therefore it's actually rational for me to be irrational about it. And then I might as well basically just vote on, basically vote on emotions, right? Let, let the Kahneman type one, you know, reasoning kick in and just vote on emotions and be mad at the other party and this or that, you know, whatever, whatever. Um, and so it's just, the, it's the kind of thing where just like people don't want to like, you know, it's, it's like magical thinking over empirical thinking. Like, you know, pe- people don't want to trace the facts on this. I, I don't know about you guys. Like I, uh, you know, I go to sometimes go to dinner parties. Sometimes I want to get out of the dinner party. I want, you know, I want it to end early. And so I, I keep a, I keep a list of things that I can bring up and talk about that are pretty much guaranteed to clear out the room. Um, <laughs> right. And one of them is, is nuclear power. Like, you know, you walk right through this topic, you know, you ask people how many deaths in total have been attributed to nuclear civilian nuclear power in the history of the field. <laughs> it's not it's like it's like literally it's like you know what's the number it's like eight um and and it's like (laughs) It's like construction accidents, right? It's like concrete falling on people, right? Is this it, in it's the like, US, so like we're putting aside no, global. The US this is global. Well. No, this, this is global. Is, this yeah, is global. it's like is, Fukushima. Is, Everybody thinks there was like mass death from Fukushima. It's well, like so. What about there's one person? What's what's well, so Fukushima? What's the, what, there's Chernobyl. a court case. There's a court case. Okay. We'll come back to Chernobyl. So there's a court case. There's yeah. actually a court case in Japan. There's a court case in Japan over over whether the number of deaths in for, for Fukushima was zero or one. Yeah, um, exactly. Because right. there's like there's like an 80 year old guy who died of lung cancer, right? And it's like, did he get the lung cancer from Fukushima, or did he get the lung cancer the way everybody else gets lung cancer? And not, you know, I don't know if you've been in Japan, people smoke a lot. I, I don't know if he was a smoker, maybe yeah. he was, but like literally, it was like is it zero or one, right? This, this idea, uh, Three Mile Island number of deaths on Three Mile Island zero, zero. right? Yeah. And so you just got this giant overlay, right, of emotion. You've got what used to be called, you know, the ick factor um, and, uh, you know, this huge overlay. So Chernobyl is interesting for a couple, couple of different reasons. One is Chernobyl was military military reactor, not a civilian reactor. <laughs> Number two, it was, it was the Soviet Union, which was not, you know, known for, <laughs> for things being well run. Um, and then, look, you know, the other thing is all the existing reactors we have as a consequence of the fact we don't build new, new, new plants, they're all 40-year-old designs, right? They're all ancient, right? And so they're... they're so on, as they say in comic book movies, like on Earth 2, like we have a thousand, you know, brand new state of the art nuclear reactors. Right. Um, and they've, they've all been designed from scratch today. But by the way, there's a completely different way to build nuclear reactors. Like so one, one of the big concerns on nuclear reactors, give you an idea of what would be possible if we decided to do this. One of the big concerns with nuclear reactors is, you know, there's there's sort of the, melt, the meltdown risk. And then there's this sort of waste kind of issue, which is like, what you know, what do you do with the waste? And, and historically, these reactors have been these giant, you know, sort of single things. They've been kind of like mainframe computers. They've been like these giant kind of single things. And then you've got this issue of kind of how to deal with them. There's a whole different way to build it, which is more how server farms get built today, which is you could build you could build a thousand small reactors and you could basically build them in basically pre-constructed concrete bunkers um, where you basically build a reactor. You fill in the bunker. The reactor runs lights out inside the bunker for as long as it runs. Let's call it 10 years or 15 years. It runs. When it's done running and the fuel runs out, it just, that's it. It's done. It's entombed. It's done. You leave it there. You don't move it. You don't go in and service it. There, there's nobody. There's nobody there. Nobody can get sick. There's nobody there. And then the waste just sits, you know, it's, this is like a, you know, this is like a, you know, this would be like a shipping unit kind of thing. And you mm-hmm. just like, let it sit there and you never open it. Right. And you, and you know, this is this tiny foot, you know, footprint, put this anywhere you want. Um, and so you could have a thousand of those. And, and basically what you have is you know, a razor blade, you know, uh, they're, you know, these become disposable. And, and by the way, this is how server farms run. This was in computing. We went from the centralized mainframe to these so-called distributed systems where you have thousands of smaller servers running in common. When a server burns out, right, in like the Google data center, they never replace it, right? They, they just leave it in the rack and they, they just let it sit. And then they just, you know, they just buy new ones. Um, and, and so you, you could build nuclear reactors that way. They would be, you know, they would be like by far the safest thing we've ever done. You know, again, somebody could like get their foot stuck in the concrete or something like, but there's no other thing that could happen. Um, and so, yeah, we could do it. It would completely eliminate even the risks that people are still worried about. This takes us to a 
thing. Actually, you made this reference. I want to follow up on it. Um, then we'll get to a American dream conversation. You referenced like managerial capitalism. And on that same like Tyler Cowen episode, you mentioned James Burnham. Like we're huge, like Michael Lind fans. A lot of people in the podcast have read Michael Lind's work and Michael's really worked to basically bring Burnham thought back into the discourse of it. But could you just explain like who James Burnham is? Like what's the reference to managerial capitalism? And then we'll spend some time there. Yeah, so Burn- Burnham is this really interesting character. I, I you know, I, I spent a lot of the last five years like trying to understand basically, you know, was it WTF happened in 2015? Uh, dot com. What I've been trying to figure name, out, by the way. Maybe that you should launch that. <laughs> yeah, that would, well, exactly. Yeah. Ex- exactly. And so, yeah. um, you know, I, I was like, okay, clearly, I don't understand what's happening. I don't understand what's happening on the left and the right. I don't understand any of this stuff. So. I went up to do a bunch of reading and I, and I discovered this guy, James Burnham and, and just for people who haven't heard. So James Burnham's very interesting cat. He was one, he was one of the leading, I think maybe the leading kind of American political theorist of the 20th century. Um, he is a very interesting guy. He's a sort of a classic, you know, he's classic sort of blue blood kind of American, you know, whatever Princeton educated. Um, but, um, you know, like, like every cool smart person of his era, which was like the 1920s, 1930s, he became a communist. Um, and in fact, he became such a communist that he became a major leader of the communist movement in the U S and he became very personally close with, uh, with Leon Trotsky himself, mm. um, and ended up actually like working with Leon Trotsky on the global revolution. He, he went with Trotsky when there was a, the Trotsky Stalin split. He kind of, he was a Trotskyite, you know, kind of fighting the Stalinists, uh, in the movement, um, which was ultimately the losing position, but, um, you know, he, he was, he was very into that. And then he got in this basically in the 1930s, he basically started figuring out that communism just didn't work. Um, and he's this very analytical, empirical thinker. Um, and so he basically got in this huge public fight with Leon Trotsky, where he's like, look, you're, you're making all these promises. None of this stuff is actually happening. Trotsky got all mad at him, excommunicated him, the whole thing. Um, Burnham then went through this period where he wrote a whole sequence of books, kind of migrated politically. And then he actually ended up on the right. He ended up as a founder of National Review. And, and Buckley at National Review always said he was like the intellectual guiding light of, of National Review. He he had a stroke later in his life. And so his, his working life kind of ended, I think, in the 1970s. Um, but um, for that first couple of decades of National Review, the, the people around him credited him with kind of being the intellectual kind of leader. And so he's one of these classic, you know, kind of guys who went on kind of the full journey. Um, and along the way, he sort of, he, he was a very sort of sharp analyst of the structure of politics. Um, and there's a, a lot we could talk about, but the, the, the thing I'd highlight is one of the, one of the very important books he wrote was called the managerial managerial revolution. And basically what he said was, he said, there's two forms of capitalism. He said, there's, there's the classic form of capitalism that everybody kind of has in their mind. And today you might think of it as like Robert Bear and capitalism or Randy and capitalism or something like that, you know, um, and it's a bourgeois capitalism and it's bourgeois capitalism. that sort of Marxism. Marx was sort of rebelling against. And, 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 and bourgeois capitalism was kind of what we described with like the railroads, for example, which is basically you, you'd have a guy who basically like started and ran the company um, and was the industrial baron. You know, it's Andrew Carnegie or, you know, any any of these, you know, Vanderbilt or any of these characters at that, that, you know, there's great books on all these guys now. Um, you know, Andrew Mellon, all these all these people, Bessemer, you know, all these people. And and, and you'd have this guy and, you know, uh, Theodore Vale was this for at and um, Alfred Sloan was this for General Motors. And so you'd have this guy who would basically build this giant, you know, he, he might build a small business, he might build a corner store, which counted as bourgeois capitalism, but he also might build the railroad, or he might build the telegraph system, or he might build the whatever, William Paley, he might build CBS, the broadcasting network, or whatever it is. Um, but it was a model of direct ownership, right? And so you'd have somebody who like directly owned and controlled the enterprise. Um, and then basically what he said is there's a new model, and he wrote this in around 1940, he said there's a new model emerging in contrast to bourgeois capitalism, which is managerial capitalism, which is you have even larger scale industrial enterprises getting built, and then ultimately these giant service industries like healthcare and education getting built, financial services. Um, but you don't have a guy with like direct control. What you have is this layer of in- intermediary managers, right? And, and we use terms for that like board of directors, um, executive team, um, and then we have you know this idea of you know we have these business schools that sort of train up these professional managers that go to work for these companies. And then by the way, the same thing on the investor side, um, you know, investors, to, you know, you can, you can invest your own, your own money. Most people don't invest their own money. Most people give their money to an investment manager to manage. Right. And so, so what, and so the term manager basically means somebody who is in control, but doesn't own, right. Or, or, or agent, not principal, right. If you've heard of the, you know, the principal agent kind of problem, right. Mm-hmm. Classic problem in economics, you know, it's, this is the agent, not the principal. And, and then basically what he said is the future era of these, these huge scale systems that are getting built and these big industrial companies and service companies that are getting built, they're no longer run by their owners. They're, they're run by these professional managers. They're, the professional managers on the, on, the, on the operation side and professional managers on the investor side, 
they are representing this dispersed base of shareholders that basically, as a consequence, are going to end up with no power. So, so the managers are going to end up with no power, but this is a big problem because the managers don't actually own the thing, right? So they're, they're in an ideal position to exploit their position against the interests of, right, basically dispersed owners, right? And you, and you read this book in 1940, and you're like, holy Lord, like this is exactly, like, this is exactly what we have today. Like this, this is the exact structure. You know, he just described the Fortune 500 and the profet, you know, and, and, and BlackRock. Like he, he, you know, he, he nailed it in one. And then with, with all the problems that flow from that. So I have to ask right. you the follow-up yeah, to end all follow-ups, which is I love WTF happened in 2015. Like what are some other just like books, resources, thoughts that have come out of that? Because that's basically this podcast, um, like the whole realignment idea. Like realignment. that is, this is our, this is our attempt to answer the question. So please just talk more about that. Well, there's a bunch. So, you know, a really big one is the, I don't know if you could talk to him, but Martin Gurry, um, you yeah. know, is a, oh, yeah. is a big one. So, um, you know, Martin, for people who haven't read it, the, the book, um, you know, Revolt of the Public and the Crisis of Authority, um, you know, Martin, that, that's a really, it was a prescient book and is a really good kind of undressing of, and, and anyway, what, what, what Martin really, really goes after is, and, and with a lot of these things, it's like, did something actually happen in 2015 overnight or were there long-term trends building? And I think Martin would take the view that there were long-term trends building. Then the long-term trends were basically the collapse of trust in traditional forms of authority. Um, you know, Gallup has Gallup polls every year on, on basically trust in large institutions. Um, another thing, another WTF happened in 1971 is starting in the 1970s. Um, trust Amer American Americans broadly, their trust in large institutions has been sort of falling across the board, uh, you know, for the last 50 years. Um, Martin and I, whenever I, I, I know Martin, whenever I argue with him about it, you know, I always make the argument, um, you know, like, isn't, isn't that collapse in trust deserved, <laughs> right? Like, you know, it, like if, if I no longer trust, you know, whatever it is, like is, you know, the government or whatever it is, is that because like, there's something wrong with me that I, you know, that I, I, I'm now cynical and I don't, or nihilistic and I don't trust these people or is it these people don't actually deserve my trust. And he usually like laughs and concedes the point. And then he says, okay, fine. But the, the corresponding question is, okay, you don't trust the existing institution. Okay. So now what, right? Like, like what's on the other end of the collapse of a traditional institution. Right. And of course, being on the tech side, I tend to start waving my hands and I say, well, we'll build some sort of network and we'll have a blockchain and this and that. And he's like, look, like political legitimacy and authority, like is not easily built. Um, right. And quick, it's hard to quick, get people to, to quick yeah. follow up, Mark. Um, Cause I, I love this topic in this area. Was government less trustworthy after 1971? So, like, was was government always not trustworthy, or did things get worse? So, this is the gazillion. To me, this is the gazillion dollar question. So, so I like to look at this through kind of the 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 the, the myth or legend, whatever you want to call it, of Walter Cronkite, right? Which is mm -hmm. like, you know, the the one thing everybody. This is another, but this is another thing on my list of how to clear out a dinner party. Um, Walter Cronkite, the challenge is the myth of Walter Cronkite, right? Which is just like, okay, Walter Cronkite. Like, we used to live in this like basically trust nirvana where we had this guy that we knew we could trust. His name was Walter Cronkite. He came on TV at night, and we knew we could trust him. And why did we know why we could trust him? Because he turned on the Vietnam War um, in 1968. He came out strongly negative against the Vietnam War. And, and, and you know, the sort of mystique goes that that was such a heretical thing to do at the time. Um, but it really demonstrated that he he had the truth on his side. And then all these other, you know, the Nixon administration, the, you know, the, 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 the well, LBJ and the Nixon administration were lying. And so therefore, it's like, you know, and, but then it's like, at least we could trust like Cronkite. And then, you know, boy, where did Walter Cronkite go? And of course, my answer is, well, what was what were, what were Walter Cronkite's views in the Vietnam War before 1968? Yes, right. Because like, we didn't go into Vietnam in 1968. At that point, you know, we had been there for what, six years, and you know, the French had been there for another whatever decade before that. And so it's like, apparently this guy who we all think we can trust apparently was like on the completely wrong side of the issue by your own definition for the, you know, for 15 years prior. Okay. So what good is he? Right. And, 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 and then it goes exactly to the thing you guys brought up earlier, which is okay. A very popular thing to do today is basically say the collapse of trust is caused by the collapse of trust either caused by social media causing people to become, you know, whatever conspiracy theorists or not, not interested in the truth, or you could argue social media is exposing a level of rot, right? That, and, and then you could kind of say, you know, to your, to your question, like, was the rot there before or is, is the rot new? So you have to think in terms of counterfactuals, right? So what if you guys mentioned this earlier, what if we had had social media? What if we had had social media during the Bay of Pigs, right? What if we had had social media during the Cuban Missile Crisis? Like what if we had had social media during after the Kennedy assassination? What if we had had social media during Vietnam, right? Like what, what if we had had social media during World War II, right? Mm -hmm. Like how differently would we have experienced those eras, Right. What would we have, you know, to your question, like, what would we have learned that we didn't know? Like, what would have been exposed? 
Uh, you mentioned the L- uh, Kiro's LBJ series, like you know, mm-hmm. the, just one great example is uh, the, the, that amazing sequence in his in the the volume of the book that talks about the Kennedy assassination. You know, it does this kind of TikTok back and forth between Kennedy on the way to getting you know assassinated in Dallas, and then LBJ was about to get indicted, right? And and like the LBJ is getting indicted for whatever fraud around the whatever his TV stations in Texas or whatever, because like Bobby Baker. The- I actually have a very rare copy of that here. It's there's very right? few of them published the Bobby Baker story of exactly how he was about to get indicted in 1963. Oh, and by the way, apparently in 1964, yeah. 1963, apparently I didn't know this. Apparently, you could be the sitting vice president of the United States and own TV stations. Like yeah. that's pretty. No, that's pretty he, cool. well, his, his, his wife he, owned he, it. He, yeah, 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 his wife owned it. <laughs> his wife owned it exactly. That's pretty awesome, yeah. right? Um, <laughs> and like. You know, look, I read a lot about history before I read that Carol volume. I had no idea. Like, I had no clue at all. Like, I had this image of, of, of LBJ, some good, some bad. I had no idea. Like, if that happened today, like, can you imagine the level of scrutiny that that would have been? You know, would he have possibly been able to take over for JFK? Would he have gotten like blown to smithereens? Like, we'd be living in a totally different world. Right. Um, and so, you know, or, or by the way, how about this social media during the election in 1960? Right. Like, you know, what was Joe Kennedy up to in Chicago? Like, what, what if that was X rayed? Right. The same way that things get X rayed now. Um, right. With, Does you know, JFK sudden, always look as good as he looked on that debate stage? Right. Does he have Addison's no. disease? Yes or no? <laughs> yeah. What, what is he doing with teenage girls in the White House swimming pool? Right. Like, that's a great question. Yeah. Lots and lots of really interesting, like, doctor, what is Dr. Feelgood shooting him up with? Right. I finally found a book on Dr. Feelgood, by the way. Um, uh, oh, there, what is it? Specific, I actually haven't found it. Yeah. I don't remember the title, but there is a book. There's a specific uh-huh. book. There, it turns out there was an actual, there was an actual Dr. Feelgood. There was an actual guy. Um, and he's like this zealot of that period. And he would go around and give all these famous people these shots. Um, yeah. And according to the book, does a reconstruction of the chemi- chemical analysis of the shots. And according to the book, they contain, meth right yeah. and so yeah like actual meth and, and, and which you know by the way meth has a very colorful history it was also widely you know highly used by the nazis during, during world war ii as it turns out um but like you know okay is the president getting like meth shots right like uh, you know let's 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 do a big you know social media deep dive on that like so i, I don't know it's your question like we have this view of things that happen you know and there's this whole problem with history in general right which is this sort of idea they call the fallacy of historical determinism which is whatever happened in history was inevitable right the, the future is very unclear but whatever happened in the past was sort of inevitable and had to play out this way and it's like okay well number one that's just not true and then number two is like did we even know what was going on did we have any ability to question it whatsoever you know and, and then again it's like did we have any ability to x-ray it or you know to the other side you know, would we have just had a class of trust, you know, an, an, an un, unearned class of trust much earlier that would have landed us in a different world? And so, so anyway, like, I, I just think like anytime, anytime, anytime we think about any of these questions around like how we experience present day and, and compare it to the past, we just have to like envision, it's impossible. We have to envision like what would have been, what would it have been like to live through the past the way that we're living through the present? And I think it would, yeah. yeah. can we stay there for a second, Sucker? I will you go. Sure. I just have one more, one more, one more follow up here. Here's the question, though, Mark, because you're raising this is this is my controversial opinion, which isn't good from a DC think tank employee perspective. I would trade LBJ coming into the White House with arguably the most wealth of a incoming president in American history via these corrupt deals for the ability to win the space race, for the ability to win World War II, for the, let's put aside racial issues for a second, because that's that obvious elephant in the room, for the competence of the highway system in the 1950s. That was a bipartisan project. I would trade that pre-Watergate corruption. I would t- I would treat that 20 million, that um, Austin radio station as a good cost of doing business for a functioning co- country. And I think most people, if framed in the, I know it's difficult to frame with those terms, but what do you think? What, what, do you, what do you think is this is the acceptable level of corruption? Well, our system, I mean, I think there's an abstract question. Um, and let me once again restate my firm position against fraud. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I'm envisioning clips from this being used in future depositions. Yes. So I'm going to be, be very clear on that. Um, I think there's a very interesting theoretical question we could talk about. I, I would just say there's the practical thing of just like the whole purpose, like the whole putative purpose of this just incredible, you know, sort of prevention, you know, build prevention regime we have in place today. Like a huge part of it is to basically prevent fraud. Right. So government procurement famously has been like reformed, you know, 8,000 8, times. And the whole point of it is to, is to, is to, um, is to, is to prevent fraud. Now, by the way, there's still like massive fraud. So like, apparently that hasn't even worked, but like, you know, that, that's a big reason why you can't, can't do these things. Um, you know, it, you know, is the, you know, one of the classic kind of questions around this is the president even in charge of the executive branches, right? The, 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 the actual departments. And it's like, cause there are all these ethics rules, right? Around quote unquote ethics rules around what the president can or can't order the various, you know, executive branches of government to do. And so it, it's like, you know, if you wanted to subvert the executive 
executive branch in its totality, you would basically just declare it's unethical for the president to actually issue orders, you know, which is kind of what we've done, um, right? As, and this, you know, keeps popping up and kind of scandal after scandal. Um, and so, um, you know, so there's all kinds of questions around there. But then I, I would also say, if you, if you go back to these examples like, uh, you know, Apollo or Manhattan Project or the interstate highway system, you know, there's another lens on those, which again, I don't know if these would be possible today with the level of scrutiny that we'd apply on it, but you know, those were basically military, those were basically military projects. Those were basically mm -hmm. military, essentially military dictatorship projects uh, in, in a sense, which is, you know, Manhattan Project was 100% a military dictatorship, right? It was yeah. General Groves was just like the dictator. Um, and he just like, you know, he went and got all the people he needed and then told them what to do and then supported them and, you know, out, out came the atomic bomb. Um, you know, Apollo, you know, the space race was, you know, it had its civilian components, but it was basically a, you know, it was, it was like, what was that? I forget the number. I can't remember the number of time, but there's a paper that tries to show, I think it was at peak, the Apollo project at peak. I want to say it was as high as like 6% of GDP or oh, something yeah. was, That's right, That's right. Yeah. was being put into space. And so, and that was that, you know, that the, the, the ability for the government to do that was, you know, at the very least kind of the foundationally in its, in its, in its military mission. Um, and then, and then of course, you know, a big part of the space program was the ability to get the captured, you know, <laughs> Nazi space scientists, you know, to basically work on the program, which was, was of course the military. Um, so, there's that. And then even the inter interstate highway system, I'm not an expert on this, but um, there were, I think there were two reasons for the interstate highway system, right? One was to connect the country and commerce and so forth. The other was tanks, right? Uh, mm -hmm. the, the other was like, if there ever was to be a land war in, in, in the US, you would want the ability to actually get like tanks and, you know, high end military material uh, coast to coast. And so I, I, I haven't done the deep dive on this. I suspect you would find if you went all the way into this, that basically the military was behind, you know, that project to a significant extent at that time. Um, and so then, then you're in this sort of, I, I think, even even deeper question, which is like, how how much of some combination of military and dictatorship do we want, <laughs> right? Um, right? And and you know, look, like we have, you know, we still have elements of that today. You know, we've got military, we've got, we still have 800 military bases all over the world, right? We still have like troops stationed in Germany for a land war with Russia that you know at least didn't come for 70 years. I guess maybe it might come now, but it didn't come for a long time. Uh, I don't know, you know, have you ever, you know, taken a vote? Have you ever been allowed to vote on whether we should have 800 military bases around the world? Like, you know, that somehow mm -hmm. never comes up for a vote. Um, and so, you know, and again, you, you got to go back further and further. And it's like, well, I don't know. Was it was it good that there was just more flat out top down authority? Right. Was it good that the military played a bigger role? You know, could, could you ever imagine either of those or that combination of factors, you know, happening today or, or how big of a crisis would you have to happen for that to happen? Not in a low trust society, which is where yeah. you get back to the circle where we started. Yeah, well, it's interesting, though, because picking up on this, which is that what's happened to the military is what's happened to all institutions, managerial revolution, which is yeah. that that's yeah. the truth is, is that it, they, all of those projects you just cited were pre-managerial true managerial revolution of what W2F happened in 1971. I would add another one to the list is I was recently reading Jimmy Carter's biography, uh, very instructive for where we are here. But, you know, uh, Carter worked on one of the cutting edge programs of the U.S. military in the 50s, which was putting a nuclear reactor in a sub, which was basically also run by a crazy guy in the Navy who just barrel barreled through the bureaucracy and made it happen. And I'm curious, actually, to tie this to future your work, which is that the one of the promises of the web of the internet was to disrupt the managerial revolution or perhaps I'm wrong since you were there at the founding. Now, what is a possible way to disrupt that and get back to some form of legitimate ownership, actual innovation that isn't stymied by both the political cost of the managerial revolution, but what I would say is the immense economic cost of stagnation that comes with so much of that, where do you think that the future could go in that direction to get away from what I think is really putting a stranglehold on a lot of things uh, that we have lost in our history right now? Yeah, so I think the sort of ideological, I mean, you know, the internet has an interesting ideological backstory because it itself was a, it itself was a project of the military <laughs> dictatorship yeah, in some sense. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. the um, you know, the original funding, right, the original funding famously was for a, a network that could survive, you know, command and control system for nuclear uh, for the military that could survive a uh, uh, you know, nuclear strikes, you know, therefore therefore the need to do routing. Uh, around damage. Um, and then, you know, if you if you go back to um, my friend Patrick Collison's done a lot of work on this, if you go back to kind of how the even the civilian side of the internet was funded, it was these research grants that basically you had these guys uh, with names like Robert Taylor and uh, J.C.R. Licklider, and, and they could basically just hand up money. Um, and and they, they didn't really have, you know, this this whole grant process and this whole all these, you know, ethics and all the IRB and all these things. They just they just picked projects and they been people and they just handed up money. Um, and, you know, it worked like it, it created the Internet. So, um, you know, so, so there is sort of a Cold War ish 
um, you know, kind of prior world kind of aspect to, to, to where this came out of, um, you know, by the time I got involved, you know, the sort of, you know, it didn't really have an ideal, you know, it was, it was technology, the people read ideology into or ideology comes out of, but, you know, if, if anything, you'd say it was like a wired, you know, wired magazine ish. You remember John Perry Barlow, the, the declaration of independence of cyberspace, like, it, mm-hmm. you know, like we weren't all literally on that page, but it was like this sort of loose libertarian, like, um, you know, sort of classically liberal enlightenment kind of, um, you know, commun- communication is good. Connecting people is good. Information sharing is good. Um, you know, letting people, you know, basically emer- emergent phenomena are good. Um, you know, Peter Thiel talks about, right. Determinate um, optimism versus indeterminate optimism. Determinate yes. optimism is we're going to put a man on the moon. Indeterminate optimism is we're going to build a network. We're going to connect everybody together. And then all kinds of amazing things are going to happen. You know, we don't know what those things are, right? We don't anticipate Skype and Zoom and, you know, Amazon and eBay and Google and so forth. But like, you know, smart kids will figure something out and they'll build lots of interesting things. And so we were definitely more on that. Like nobody who worked on the internet ever really had a clear idea of what the use cases would be until until mm-hmm. they emerged. And so it it, 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 it was one of those. Um, and by the way, I would say, you know, look, basically all of that worked, right? Like, it, you know, it kind of, it, it all happened, it all, it all, it all, it all panned out. And there are many thousands and thousands of use cases today online that, you know, I, I certainly never would have thought of, um, you know, by the way, including, well, <laughs> we had <laughs> video conference, video conferencing goes all the way back to, uh, to, uh, to uh, 1965. Um, and uh, so there were, you know, many people had thought about that over time, but the idea that, you know, we would live in a world as, as distributed as we live in today, and we could do something like this in real time. And the idea that we could, you know, basically lots of people could work from home and, you know, so forth, or that we could go through a two-year COVID lockdown and everything would keep working because the internet, like nobody anticipated, nobody said, wow, we should build the internet because if there's ever a future pandemic, we're going to need a way to yes. keep all these companies running during a lockdown. But but yet that happened. Um, you know, so look, the, the aspirational view, um, and you know, my, my friend, I think you guys have had Balaji Srinivasan on yeah. in the past. You it's know. coming up in a few weeks for network state. So very, we're okay, good. The, He's writing, writing the whole yeah, book yeah. on this, right? So the, the, coming, the, yeah. the most aggressive kind of aspirational view, and this is my, my big argument with Martin, Martin Gurria I talked about, is my big, the, the aspirational view is, is basically we we can't like maybe we live in a world where we can no longer build top down institutions that people trust um, and that have authority um, and that have power because we've basically made that illegal as we discussed um, maybe um, you know we can basically build networks right maybe instead of building hierarchies right top down institutions maybe what we should do is build bottoms up networks right and maybe that's where people are going to put their trust in the future maybe that's the new model by the way maybe they're going to be even more participatory than these institutions of the past you know maybe maybe they fit better with the ethic of the times they're they're you know, kind of more inherently more egalitarian. Um, you know, maybe they'll be able to harness more kind of emergent energy. You'll be able to have a lot, a lot more people contributing than you did in the old days of the top down, the top down projects. But we're going to basically have all these basically bottoms up networks get built. And, and of course, a lot of those networks are going to take the form of these cryptocurrency, blockchain, Web3 networks. And, and Biology will give you the, the, the with his new book the full the full dose of this idea. Um, dose right, kind is of the right word. <laughs> it's used right there. Right. You know, basically, <laughs> ultimately, can we build new nation states? If can we build new nation yes. states on the network, or, or or can we build new structures that basically do the things the nation states are no longer able to do? Um, right. And this is you know this is this you know this goes back to you know his his favorite book and a favorite book of mine, the sovereign individual, and kind of its forecast that you know in the future governments would have to compete for citizenship and you know for citizens to be able to work productively for them, and, and maybe the, this is a way to kind of reconfigure how the concept of political authority works over time. And maybe you, you have a better world coming out the other end of that. So, so kind of reflexively, we, we go to this, we go to this idea of, okay, let's, let's get, let's get to work building these networks. Um, you know, in a, in a, in, again, on, on earth two, we're all busy building, you know, nuclear power plants and dams and road systems. Owned and, by DAOs, you know. <laughs> right. Well, yeah, maybe, maybe, and right. Maybe, maybe that's what happens. Like maybe the next, you know, look, maybe, you know, uh, oh, oh, I wanted to actually close the loop. This is relevant. So I wanted to close the loop on the bourgeois capitalism, managerial capitalism yes. thing, which is basically, this is very relevant to this. So managerial capitalism basically took over, he, you know, he documented it kind of in the early 1940s, um, you know, kind of fully took over by the 1950s. By the 1950s, even Joseph Schumpeter, who's the famous kind of, um, you know, kind of prophet of, of creative destruction, even he threw in the towel and he wrote a book and he basically said, the age of entrepreneurship is over. The age of bourgeois capitalism is over. From here on out, it's all these big combines, these big industrial multinational companies run by professional managers. And basically like that, that we, we had our run. We had our run of entrepreneurship in, in this country, in this system. And now we're just going to have these large, large managerial institutions. Um, you know, a funny thing happened, which is in the 1970s, 1980s, you had the emergence of both venture capital, which is what I do, and then private equity, you know, in the form of firms like KKR. Um, and I would argue that from a theoretical standpoint, both venture capital and private equity are kind of like a revenge of bourgeois capitalism, right? Because it, basically what happened was it turned out 
these large managerial companies basically are they're they're bad they may be good at running at scale which is kind of why why they got got so big but they're bad at innovating because the managers basically as a as a as a group are not very good at building new things they're they're not builders their managers not builders right they're managerial not bourgeois um and so it it turned out they're just not good at building new things therefore venture capital emerged Right. And then they're also not very good at kind of voluntarily reorganizing for efficiency. They, they have a tendency to kind of let their organizations go and become bloated. And, and then therefore the emergence of private equity to basically go back and clean these up. Um, and so and so and in financial terms, what happened was an arbitrage was opened up between managerial capitalism and bourgeois capitalism, where all of a sudden you could make money by bringing bourgeois capitalism back, which is which is basically what we do. Um, and so, you know, look, you, you've got you've got existing like industrial America running the managerial model. You've got like the high tech world running the bourgeois capitalist model, but but primarily in the virtual realm. Um, and now you've got this third thing, which is this net, you know, this network. We're building these networks. You know, are these networks managerial because you've got this large dispersed base of you know DAO owners that really have no authority, and then there's a manager in charge who doesn't own it but controls it. So do, does that become a new form of network managerial capitalism, or or is it more like tech entrepreneurship where you have like a benevolent dictator? You've got somebody who's firmly in charge who can issue orders, and then everybody else signs up to follow. And maybe that's you know the future of of, of, of these of these network or, or, or DAO ideas. And so so it's it's exciting that we've reopened this box and that we're going to try to explore all this. Mm-hmm. Um, it would be great if, in the process, we could also go do all this stuff in the real world. I'm, I'm you know, <laughs> I'm not holding my breath, but at, at least we get to think hard about the kind of political and economic structure underneath this, and maybe some new things will become possible. So, two part question on the crypto one. The first part is going to be super super easy. I just want you to, because this is a more normie adjacent show than like the tech one. So just give a quick articulation of your web three thesis. And then this, so like, just what is web three, but the second part, um, obviously listeners are likely aware of the fact that there was a crypto crash, um, in the past few weeks, but an interesting way of thinking about this dynamic is there was a dot com bubble. And out of that dot com bubble, you have Amazon and you have Google and you have Facebook. You know, we all know that there's that famous uh everyone no one knows the person's name, but it's always dunked on. There was that stock analyst who said, see, I told you so. You guys are totally screwed. Amazon isn't worth anything. Look at this dot-com bubble. And then of course we get no doubt search the New York Times as archive and find someone dunking on the internet in the 1980s. So in Wait. both those two cases, the short-term analyst was missing something. Likely our audience is going to be hyper crypto skeptical. You are not crypto skeptical. Post crash of a few weeks ago, not once you define what Web3 actually is, what do you think you are not missing that's going to be the transformational aspect of this? Yeah, so let me lay out a theory of change, of kind of technological change, of kind of how these things happen. And this is a theory that you could apply to the PC. You could apply this to the, um, you can apply this to the internet. You can apply this to crypto web three today. <laughs> By the way, you could apply this to any other prior. You could apply this to the railroads, tele- all these, all these historical systems. So mm-hmm. basically, think of think of a graph um, that sort of shows progress over time, um, and then it shows sort of three forms of progress over time. And let's say the three layers. The underlying layer is technological change. So you know, actual substantive improvement in the technology that we're talking about. Um, the second layer is societal change, right? Which is sort of the willingness of society of sort of you know people writ large to actually accept the change and, and actually want it, right? And, and sort of use the the, the thing that results. Um, and then sort of the third layer is sort of financial markets change. So the the, the ability for the financial markets to be able to think clearly and, and basically assign value, right? And basically and, and, and allocate capital. Um, um, and, and 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 basically, the world I live in is the world of those three graphs. So, so you know, the, the core thing that we do is we fund technologists building new technology. Um, once they have the new technology working, we go to the second layer. We try to help them actually go get customers, right? Actually, have people at large in society, hopefully large numbers of people, right? Actually, use the thing, right? Which which is a challenge, right? It's, it's a classic thing. Just because you have the thing doesn't mean everybody wants the thing. And so you, you have to you have to, you know sales marketing, right? You have to at some point you have to go get people to, to get people to want to use it, and then. You know, the third layer is the financial side, which is, you know, we 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 fund these companies and we want other people to fund these companies and someday we want them to go public or, you know, have a crypto token or like whatever it is. Um, and, you know, for investors to in, be, oh, in the long run for everybody to be able to invest in it, right, um, in the fullness of time. And so, you know, f- to have the financial markets, you know, kind of un- un- understand it. 
um, you know, if I if I draw this graph, the sort of abstract version would be basically technological progress is kind of in a straight line. And I, it's, it's kind of in a straight linear line. The reason it's in a straight linear line basically is that every day, you know, all the world's engineers go to work and they work for the day and they write some code and they work on designs and they make, they make the technology a little bit better. And that mm -hmm. happens day in and day out. And that happens during boom times and bus times and whatever. It's just because engineers are engineers. This is what they do. Um, and then you could kind of say, so it's sort of a straight line of improvement. And then every once in a while, I would say you have these like stair step kind of jumps and the stair step kind of happens when you kind of have a critical mass when enough underlying work has happened that makes like a new thing fundamentally possible. So like critical mass would be PC, right? And then internet, right? And then, um, you know, and then, um, you know, smartphone. So you have these jumps. So it's, it's kind of the straight line with these little stair steps along the way. But it's interesting, like it basically, it only goes up. It goes up at a relatively constant pace. It never really goes backwards. You know, there's there's myths and legends that the car companies have, you know, these patents in their vaults for like the, you know, infinite combustion engine that never, you know, needs fuel, but your perpetual motion machines. Like, as far as I can tell, I, I've never seen anything like that. Vinyl, it's basically vinyl is the one thing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so record, so rec record, record, sa record sales have outpaced yeah. CD sales. So, so, uh, funny story, um, uh, blind and I have a lot of audio file friends, um, and I'm sympathetic to the argument, um, cause I, you know, it's, I, I understand the tactical appeal of, of vinyl and the emotional kind of appeal of it. A fun fact, uh, in, 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 in blind studies, uh, you can't tell the difference. Um, I'm sure. yeah, I knew it. <laughs> right? <laughs> TDs and LPs sound exactly identical. Your ears not capable of telling the difference. Um, it's basically, it's all, it's all, it's, it's magical thing. It's fantasy. No, it's a fun yeah, fantasy, it's, right? That's the, fine. The, the, the LPs yeah. look awesome, right? Like, they're, they're yeah, very cool. like when, you know, when you bring the, when you bring the young lady or young man over to your place, like, you know, they, they look awesome. Um, so, so oh, wait, people to, like but it. to your um, point though, this is actually helpful. Your, your point is yeah. it's not actually at a technological level any different is that is, is just to like put a pin on what you're saying oh it was only progress it, it, basically there's only technological progress like, okay so we, yeah because we're talking about an aesthetic debate it looks cooler mm -hmm. than the cd it so looks it's cooler. Kind of separate okay cool but Thanks. technologically yeah. cds were superior the technologies and by the way look at i'm a music i love classical music early digital recordings did they, they often they the, the produce on the production side they had some work to do to kind of get it get it dialed in and get it tuned in but like to, today any modern recording like it's the the cd sounds fantastic so um so um but and then the cd was just better it was just better it doesn't you know it, it you know it doesn't have the clicks and the pops and the whole thing and and you know it's all, all these other advantages and then of course you make this, now the cd goes away it's just streaming which is clearly better right um and so um yeah so so basically technological progress is kind of kind of constant with these kind of stair steps um okay um, then societal change. Well, now we're in a totally different world because now we're in a world of people and then we're in a world of people operating in groups and we're in a world of people operating in groups. Now we're like, you know, in your guys' world, which is like, okay, why do large groups yeah. of people do what they do? And the answer is like all of the smartest people in human civilization for thousands of years have been trying to figure out why people do what they do, especially in groups, right? Um, like there's something about humans where like we think we live as individuals in reality, we live more as members of groups. And then of course, groups are dumber than individuals, right? So we keep we keep like backsliding into these weird, you know, kind of group, group you know, kind of phenomena. Phenomenon. And, and one of the things that happens, people get in groups, you know, large groups of people to decide whether or not they're going to do a new thing, right? They, you know, they're going to decide whether or not they do, you know, do this or that, go out to this you know, place at night or activity for that, or collect stamps or collect coins or like go on the internet, or like what, whatever it is that they, you know, shave, not shave, right? Like they make all these like, you know, or, or by the way, like value aesthetics, like they make all these decisions that are not emotional decisions or not lot purely logical decisions. They make these kind of uh, other, you know, kind of other, you know, decisions and other factors that are important to them. Um, and so then we're in sort of the realm of sociology, you know, sort of psychology, sociology. And, and, and that's very important in our world because it's like, okay, how do we get a large group of people to kind of stand up and say, yeah, I want that thing. Like that, that thing now exists and I want that thing. And, and by the way, that thing is probably not perfect uh, uh, in day one. It probably has real issues, right? Like, you know, the, the, the iPhone to this day, the battery dies, right? Like, you know, like, you know, presumably it'd be easier to sell iPhones if the battery lasted for a week. Are mm -hmm. people going to be willing to use a, a phone where the, you have to, you know, the battery might die late, late in the day. It turns out they are, but like, it, you know, there, there was a cycle, there was a psychological kind of cliff that had to be overcome to, to, to get people to do that. And you, and you find that true of like all, all new technologies kind of have, have to get sold like this. Uh, people have to have to find the benefits worth, worth the trade-offs. And so, so it's, it's, it's the sort of social effects and, and, you know, so, social effects being what they are, right. There's, there's this classic adoption curve in tech, which is there's like a certain number of sort of early adopters that kind of pride themselves on the first, you know, having the first of everything. Um, and then there's like this, the sort of, uh, there's the, then there's the sort of mainstream adoption curve of, of kind of people who just kind of want to go with the flow. And then, uh, and then on the other side, there's people who are like very change resistant, but they're finally like, okay, you know, like, you know, damn it. Like I'm going to have to like, I'm gonna have to get rid of my flip phone. I'm going to have to, you know, get, get an iPhone. And so then we're, we're in this, we're, anyway, we're in this like sociological, political, you know, sort of, um, um, you know, almost anthropological realm. 
Um, and then the third layer on top of that is, is the financial markets. And the financial markets, like that curve is like, it's like a constant cardiac arrest. Yeah. Like the, the the financial, I don't know if you guys would notice, but the financial markets are like crazy, right? Yes. And 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 they're crazy to the upside, they're crazy to the downside. Um, ben Graham, who's like the patron, patron saint of like stock market investing, wrote this book hundred years ago. Um, he described it as follows. He said, basically, you need to, as an investor, you need to think about the stock market as he, he gave it, a, he sort of gave it a, gave it a name. So think of it as a person, Mr. Market. Uh, and he said, you know, look, Mr. Market gets up every morning, shaves, puts on his tie, puts on his hat. You know, this is like 1920. So he like puts on the hat um, and he goes to his office and, 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 and any given day, Mr. Market will offer to buy a stock from you at price X and he will offer, offer, offer to sell that stock to you at price Y. Um, and that's the bid ask spread of the market. Um, and he said the, the thing with Mr. Market is he is, he's a wonderful guy. Um, and he's always up for a trade, but the problem is like, he's bipolar, like he's out of his freaking mind, right? He's like full on manic depressive. He has some days where he is euphoric to the moon. Everything's going to go great. He, he, you know, he'll give everybody the maximum benefit out. He has other days where he's like horribly depressive. He wants to get rid of everything. The world is ending. And he he's going to whip back and forth between manic and, and and depressive all the time. And there's not a you know it, it, basically I'm, I'm extrapolating here, but he's, he was kind of saying it's like it's like dealing with you know it's like dealing with some it's like dealing with somebody with like a severe behavioral issues. It's like you can spend a lot of time trying to figure out what's happening inside the black box. Um, <laughs> you may spend a lot of your life trying to do that. You may never actually get there and actually understand it. At some point, it's just good to kind of maybe resolve to the point of just like, look, this person's going to be unpredictable. They're going to be kind of you, you know, they're going to be kind of random in their behavior. Um, and, and, and that just is what it is. And we could have a long discussion. The financial market is an emerging phenomenon of all these kind of people running around and, and they, they, they just kind of act like this. And so to your point on Amazon, like in any given era, people are willing to give Jeff Bezos the benefit of the doubt that he can make this thing go to the moon. And there have been times when they, people were absolutely convinced that he was going to drive the thing bankrupt. And, and then there's this concept, George Soros has this concept of re reflexivity. Um, sorry, to, sorry to bring up, <laughs> sorry like, to, bring, uh -oh. to bring him up yeah. on this <laughs> podcast, but um, you know, he has this concept of reflexivity where what people believe can help determine what actually happens. And then what actually happens can change what people believe. And so there's some weird feedback loop between like belief and reality, which is to say like, if the stock market believes something's going to happen, they will channel capital towards it. That capital will make it more likely that that thing happens, right? Uh, if they don't believe something's going to happen, they'll withdraw capital from it, and that will make it less likely that thing will happen. But if it does happen, that'll cause them to believe that it, you know, will happen more in the future. And so you you have this weird ping pong thing that happens in these markets. And so the so 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 you can see so basically take the three lines: technological progress like that, sociological progress kind of in these big swings, right? Of these like large herd motion through the population, and then financial markets like fucking just crazy, you know, psych psych psychotic stuff. And and that's basically the world we live in. And so people, people ask me like, you know, you know, yeah, the price of Bitcoin is up or down. Like why, you know, why did the price of Bitcoin go? I don't know. Mr. Market's nuts, right? Like he's doing his thing and he's like trading like crazy. And he's, you know, the average stock on the stock market trades like every three nanoseconds or something. You know, I don't know why. There's an old, there's an old, uh, there's an old adage in economics called "never reason from a price change," uh, hmm. which basically says like these markets are just they're like hyper complicated. People have all kinds of both sane and crazy ideas. Uh, you never want to work backwards from a price change. You basically want to work forwards in terms of fundamentals. You know what we do, and what we would always encourage people to do is basically as much as possible to try to tune that stuff out, and then fo focus on that bottom line. Right? Like what we do is we spend all our time like on that bottom line, which is like, okay, is this technology actually real? Can it be made to work? Is it important? And then, of course, if that happens, like, can we get a lot of people to use it? And 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 yeah, that's and and, and we're strong. And we're very strong believers in Web three and on, on, on those two lines for sure. And, and then in the in the long run, Ben Graham also said in the long in the short run, the market's a voting machine. Uh, in the long run, it's a weighing machine. Like in the long run, financial mm -hmm. markets will get to a value that will be real for the actual intrinsic underlying value of the asset. And so the, for long run investors, you want to think in, in, term, in, in those terms, but that's like, you know, decade long terms. No, that's really great because I want to really put a pin on what you're saying here. So the to the metaphor I started with, the thing that a skeptical but good faith listener would be getting wrong with crypto is reducing the entire value prop to the stock to the to the price from yeah. two or three weeks ago. If you're yeah. just looking at your like your, your Coinbase or your Gemini or your crypto.com account and saying, well, it was this and now it's lower, therefore this is worthless. What you are saying, what they would be missing is thinking that that is the fundamental thing here. And instead one should focus on the fundamentals moving forward. So well, what the, I, what the yeah. What the what the classic investor does in the stock market is, of course, they buy high and sell low. Yeah. Right. So, 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 so with the, with the, with the, what the marginal investor does is they get excited when they get excited when prices go up and they mm -hmm. buy, and, and they get depressed when prices go down and they sell. 
right? It's a great way to lose money, right? What, what you want to do, at least in theory, is, is the opposite, right? It's like when everybody's euphoric, right? That, that's when you want to sell. When so, everybody is like depressed, that's when you want to buy. But but this goes to the sociological thing. To, 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 to buy low, sell high, you have to step out of the herd, right? And of course, what's the hardest thing for any individual human being to do is step out of the herd. Like who wants to do that? And, and so, yeah. And so and, and anyway, so this is like all incredibly well understood from like a behavior, you'll take any behavioral economics course or whatever, like they'll explain all this to you. It's all completely well understood. The fact that people understand it has not changed the behavior at all. Right. Um, one so actually, more, oh, one ahead, more Marshall. quick Web3 question before we get to the recession issue, Sagar. Um, you talked about this really interesting idea with Tyler Cowen. You were talking about like Web3 podcasting, how crypto could change things. And I was just thinking a lot about that. I know you've studied the history of the record industry and how these changes actually happen. So I want to ask, because we're getting to the fundamentals question. So like, let's put aside like the price, let's focus on the fundamentals. So you know of his history, I'm saying this for the audience, you go from the, once again, vinyl to the tape cassette, to the CD, to the MP3. Um, at a core level, the cassette, vinyl, and then CD are the same package. They, they're the record industry saying, we're going to sell you 18 songs all together, whether or not you want all the songs. It doesn't matter if you want the three songs, they're the big ones. We're going to sell you the whole thing. It costs you 20 bucks or more. What the MP3 does is the MP3 obviously makes it so that a consumer could say, hey, I actually just want the three best songs from Britney Spears' new, ind- new album. That fundamentally reshapes the record industry. That's a technological development changing not only like the way users behave, but like reshaping the industry. I'm curious, let's put aside, you know, maybe Sagar and I want to launch a realignment NFT. Maybe we could maybe get that Joe Rogan deal is what you're talking about. Maybe we could get that Joe Rogan deal, but in five years, actually a web three native deal will be better. Let's put those aside. Let's focus on users. I'm curious, do you see the equivalent of a, the record industry is forcing everyone to buy all these songs they don't want? In the in the context of crypto or even the blockchain, like is there is there is there an example that comes to mind of a situation where, wow, like this blockchain technology enables a step change improvement in a process that will make actual users jazzed, separate from just you and I, because you know people are, people still have labels even though there's an MP3 dominated thing. So what do you, what do you think about that? Yeah, that's right. So so first the first big fight on this was actually it was actually sheet music. Um, wow. right. <laughs> so there was a time, there was a time when what music was, was the musician shows up and plays for you in person. Right. And of course only rich people, you know, only rich people could ever have musicians show up and play in person. Right. Um, and then there was a time when, and, and in theory, anybody in the audience could like listen to it. And if they're a good enough musician, maybe they could, you know, approximate it again and go play it kind of, pi- pi- you know, oops, excuse me. They could kind of pirate it. Right. Um, but, uh, you know, th- that generally didn't happen. It was just that musician and, and, and his music. Um, so then they, they then, then when publishing emerged, when, you know, after the printing, Press, it's like, okay, now we can have sheet music. And so we can have, you know, infinitely reproducible music. You and another musician can play the same music. And the musicians like raised holy hell at that time. Like this is like the it was just like this is like the worst thing that's ever happened to music. This is the worst thing that's ever happened to the like the life and, and economics of being a musician, because now we've got all these copycats, right? We've got all these people who can then play the thing. And so therefore the value of the live performance, of course, inevitably is going to go to zero. Um, right. And so there was like this huge fight, and should that even be legal and, and like the whole thing? And then of course, you know, in the fullness of time, it turned out actually it's like the best thing that ever happened to any sort of actual composer, any sort of anybody who creates music, it's the best thing ever because it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a way, it's a way to, it's a way to monetize the, uh, you know, the, the, the creation. So, so the cycle that you mentioned has actually been going now for like, you know, 200, 200 years. Um, the, the music industry is really kind of interesting in that they've, they've kind of, the history is they fought every single, they fought every mm-hmm. single change, right? Um, they fought every single one, you know, they fought, they fought cassette tapes, they fought cassette tapes very hard. Um, they fought, uh, C, you know, they, they fought CDs originally, they huge concerns around privacy from CDs because the, because the, the, you know, there was a huge concern. Like they didn't get that concerned about people like taping uh, playback of records because like the sound quality wasn't that good. But like the fact that CDs could be a perfect digital copy, they like really freaked out about mm-hmm. that. Um, you know, streaming, like they, you know, well, then they freaked out about Napster. Um, you know, there, there's uh, uh, <laughs> on Earth 2, the music service we all use is Napster. Yeah. Um, and, you know, Napster, you know, think Napster in 2000, if they had just put a buy button, um, you know, next to every track, right, where you could, instead of having to steal all the music, you could have just bought the copies of your favorite music like that. That would have been Spotify, you know, 20 years, you know, probably 20 years earlier. They would have made a fortune from it. And by the way, they could have used that to do everything else they do, selling concert tickets and merchandise and everything else. 
They didn't do that. They, of course, took a giant hit when streaming emerged. Um, and then that, now they're building it back, right? Now now the businesses are getting back. And then, by the way, the, the music labels, a lot of the current model is what they call 360 deals, which is basically, I'm not just your music label. I also am your touring manager, right? It turns out live music is actually really valuable. <laughs> like It turns out people actually still really like going to live performances, even though anybody can stream the music anytime they want, because people like to be together and they like to be with a musician, you know, the yep. sort of human uh, kind of aspect of that. Um, and so now the, the, now the industry is growing again, and they're kind of back up on their feet. Um, we believe, and we're, we're doing a lot of work on this. We believe that the whole web three NFT thing is so significant for the creative arts because it gives a way to imbue a concept of digital ownership, uh, and digital rights and privileges in a way that has not been possible up until now. And, and, and we believe in the long run, most, the most likely long run, uh, monetization model for lots of digital media, including music is not going to be a pay by the drink kind of thing that you have today. It's probably going to be much more of a combination um, of just free distribution of the core material coupled with sort of higher level tiers of, of digital ownership. Um, and, and, and we're increasingly convinced that that's going to be like, well, it's already happening in video games, right? So mm. one of the, one of the most, um, one of the most uh, widely played video games in the world, most successful video games the last decade is Fortnite. Fortnite, I forget, it's driving something like four or 5 billion a year of revenue right now off of, off of a single game. It's going, going very strong. It's free to play. Um, and anybody can play it for free. Um, but you can upgrade in, in the game, you can upgrade and you can buy your character outfits and you can buy them dance moves. Um, and the, whatever, four or 5 billion a year is in those free is in those paid upgrades to outfits and dance moves. You can play the game for 10 years and never buy an outfit or a, or a dance move. And in fact, they're, they're so kind of rigid. They're so kind of strict on this. You can't actually buy anything in the game that makes it more likely that you win the game. Mm-hmm. Um, you're just buying things in the game that basically reflects, you know, style and fashion and, 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 and gain your prestige. And right. And if you're like, again, if a lot of this goes back to basic human behavior, if you're flirting with the, you know, with the, uh, you know, really nice boy or girl on the other side of the, uh, of the line, but you might want to meet someday, you might want to show up in like a really cool outfit, right? Not like, uh, you know, how about that? Um, and so, you know, it's already happening in gaming, right? If you're going to design a video game today from scratch, you probably would not put it in a box and charge 50 bucks for it, right? You would probably have this kind of free, freemium, right, free to play hybrid model with these kind of paid kind of tiers on top. Um, the, the reason why we think this makes so sense is because this flows much more naturally with actual human behavior. So this whole historical pay by the drink, buy the CD, buy the album, buy the stream, whatever it is, right? The problem is you've got a digital thing that wants to basically be free, right? It wants to be infinitely reproducible, right? It, it wants, you know, basically it wants, it wants to get everywhere. It, it wants to be copied, right? It's just the thing that computers do is they copy bits. And so this whole anti-piracy thing all this time has been basically trying, it's sort of been trying to prevent water from reaching the level. It's been trying to prevent bits that want to be copied from getting copied and then trying to, and then literally to the point of, you know, trying to criminalize the customers, right? Like, like the bigger a fan of music you are in the last 20 years, the more likely you were to get sued by the music labels, right? For like, you know, for, 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 for tripping the line on, on, on piracy, right? right? Um, uh, and so, um, the, the, so instead it's like line up with human psychology, which is like, okay, maybe the music should be free. Maybe the game should be free. Maybe this, by the way, maybe the NFL game should be free. Maybe all this should be free. And then what you do is you take the fans, right? And you take the fans and you give them actual, you give them things they own, right? You get, you give them stakes and may, maybe the stake is bragging rights. Maybe the stake is the ability to use something for fashion or style or prestige. Maybe it's an actual economic stake. And here it gets complicated because it gets into securities law, but maybe the fans should actually have a stake in the thing. Uh, let me give you an example. Suppose somebody, you know, so Stan Lee famously created Spider-Man and the Marvel Universe and that now it's this, it's this giant thing. You know, he passed away, but there's this huge dispute to this day over like whether the original artists are getting cut in on the economics and, you know, and then Marvel's concerned about piracy, the movies, the whole thing. And then, you know, ultimately Marvel became this company. The company got bought by Disney. And in theory, you can buy Disney stock to have a slight ownership in Marvel if you want, but it's kind of this abstracted thing. Um, so suppose instead that the next Marvel Universe, suppose that like Spider-Man was a crypto asset, right? Suppose, suppose Spider-Man was a DAO, right? And suppose that like the Hulk was a DAO and the Thor was a DAO and then Iron Man is a DAO, right? Um, and, and, you know, DAO basically being, a, being an economic construct in the, in, in the network. And then suppose basically as a fan, right, you could act as a Spider-Man fan, you could actually own a share of Spider-Man. Right. And then you can own a share of Spider-Man that not only gives you basically uh, economic, you know, potentially economic benefits as Spider-Man succeeds as a character, but also maybe gives you a vote on the future, right, fictional trajectory of Spider-Man. Right. Or maybe gives you the ability to write actual like authorized fan fiction. Right. Or maybe gives you the right to like special access to, you know, even things like tickets to the to the to the premiere of the next movie. Right. And so you, you start to basically give special rights and privileges and, and, and actual ownership 
right? But 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 completely in the virtual realm. And then and then you have a completely different monetization model, right? And then you have a way to think about like, okay, is there like a lot of creativity in the world that maybe should exist that there's no way to fund today, right? And then maybe maybe these mechanisms become a way to fund new kinds of music, new kinds of games, new kinds of you know performing arts, you know, that today we don't even have a way to even think about funding. Hmm. My last question for you, Mark, is really one where I think it unites both people in the tech business and just really anybody, which is you started Andreessen Horowitz, I believe, in 2009. Uh, Federal Reserve is doing its thing, you know, regardless of whether you have assets or not. Inflation is out of control for a lot of general people. I feel a sense of malaise kind of coming over the economy, over thinking. I mean, how have you, having weathered both the dot-com bubble the Great Recession, and now moving possibly into whatever this is. What's your advice to people who both either work in tech or who are thinking of starting something at this moment? How should they try to read trends and charts and stick to those and try and break away from the sociological curve that you described in order to come out on the other side better than this? Yeah. So first thing I say is like, I think it's impossible to predict economic, like, I think it's impossible to make a macro prediction as to what's going to happen. So is this going to be like a sustained, you know, 2008, 2000 style downturn, That's crash, right. recession is, you know, because, you know, you remember like in, in, in March of 2000, stock market fell apart. People were like screaming and crying on TV, you know, and then all of a sudden, like, you know, things went to the moon. Right. And so <laughs> people were very, you know, everybody I knew at the time was very uh, convinced that they knew what was going to happen. And then, you know, they were basically all wrong, um, including Absolutely. in a lot of ways, me. Um, and so there, there, there is no way to predict. And so it's, it's all contingent. We don't know. And by the way, the actions that people take have a lot to do with this. Right. And so to your point on the fed, like if the fed handles this well, then it'll, you know, be a lot easier if they don't, you know, and then there's obviously midterms coming up and then the general election and who, who, you know, who knows, you know, is there political influence in the fed? I don't know. Like if there is, that'll be a big deal. Right. So, so we, we really don't know, right. Uh, we really don't know how this is going to unfold. Um, I guess what I would say is uh, maybe what are the two, what are the like, what are the cardinal sins of a time like this? So one is, yeah, tr- trying to predict things that are unpredictable uh, is a bad idea. And so the, at least what we encourage our companies to do is scenario planning and sort of contingency planning. And so it's just like, okay, be prepared for, you know, summer or winter. Um, and so just like, you know, stay loose, have option value, try to not get too locked into a single point of view. Um, you know, and, and have some flexibility and, you know, if possible, have some, you know, have some, have some fallback positions where you can kind of get through, you know, get through harder times, you know, for our companies, it's making sure they have enough cash to be able to get through, you know, a sustained downturn. Um, and so, you know, the, the, there's, there's kind of that. And then, and then, yeah, look, the other thing is, you know, as Warren Buffett has a great line. It's like when the tide goes out, we find out who's been sh- swimming with no shorts on, um, right? Like, you know, when the tide goes out, the world doesn't end. What happens is like substance becomes very important, right? Um, and so in a, in a euphoric boom time, like, okay, here's the good news about a euphoric boom time. Everything gets funded, including all the bad ideas. Yes. Right. Like everybody goes crazy. Everybody funds everything. What's the bad aspect of, 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 of the of, of the bad of the downtimes? It's like basically the it's like the tide goes out. You see who's swimming about shorts. The bad stuff no longer gets funded. Like the, the threshold for things to get funded just like goes way up. But there there are still things that are worth funding and there are still things that are worth doing. And there are still things that are worth working on. And that goes to that bottom curve I was talking about, which is. And the, the history of the tech industry is the history of this, which is during downturns, a lot of progress Happens. I'll, I'll, um, I'll give you a, a, a final book recommendation from, we talked about the, the second industrial revolution. So there's a great book, uh, Alexander Field, who's an economist, wrote a book, and I'm blanking on the title, but it's a book, it's, econ- it's a sort of revisionist economic history of the 1930s. Um, and it basically, it basically tells a very convincing story that actually the 1930s were, they were, they were, they were not an economic boom in the sense of you had obviously the Great Depression and the stock market crash. But they were, uh, I think he calls it the Great Leap Forward. I think it's the yeah, book. It's basically it's a Great Leap Forward. I was just looking up for you. The yeah. Great Leap Forward. And, and basically, it, what he basically says is the underlying substance of the economy in the 1930s basically was like a, there were gigantic advances. And in particular, there were gigantic mm-hmm. advances of the adoption of new technology. And there were gigantic uh, advances in terms of uh, underlying productivity growth. Um, and, the, and then basically, what happened was the, the sort of stock market boom that followed World War II was basically the, the delayed payoff from, from, from all of that. But but it was in the 1930s when like electrification actually happened and when the road system, when the highway system got built and when like, you know, the TV networks got built out, right? And when like a lot, a lot of these, a lot of these actual systems got built out. Um, and so like even in the 1930s, you know, it was, it was, I'm sure no fun for people to go through, but like there was a lot of real work that happened. And then that work did ultimately pay off. He, he actually also, he further argues World War II was, you know, people tend to think it's like, oh, World War II like pulled us out of the Great Depression. He, he, he argues in the book, no, actually World War II was a step backwards. World War II actually delayed mm-hmm. economic recovery. 
in the counterfactual where we didn't have World War II, the, the, the domestic economy would have been booming by the early 1940s and we would have been off to the races and we would have a clearer understanding of kind of how the 1930s actually unfolded, but with World War II delayed it. But anyways, it's an interesting theory, but the, the point being like the actual substance of what happened even in the 1930s was like really high and then ultimately did pay off. The people who worked on that contributed to that. It did pay off. It paid off in the 1940s, 1950s and, and then in, into the modern world. And so even in a bad downturn, there is a lot of very serious, hardcore, real work to be done. And there is a big payoff to come from that. Um, and, and, in the, and we see that in the tech industry, in every down, you know, we, we, we get some of our best companies coming out of boom times. We get some of our best companies coming out of the busts because um, sometimes it's a really great time for people to just like go back to basics, go back to work, you know, stop reading the you know headlines all day long and like go back to work and like just work on like building a good product and finding a customer uh, and convincing the customer it's a good idea to buy the thing. And, and, you know, that's the core of capitalism. That's the core of, you know, the, that's the foundation of economic activity. Um, and so to the extent that this is one of those times, that's certainly what we would encourage everybody to do. Two quick questions to close with. One, though, I think it's really funny when you said you remember the 2000 um, dot com crash. We were eight years old, but the way that I remember it is, I loved um, Home Grocer slash Web Van because the peach on the van and the peach guy stopped showing up. Um, and that's how my mom explained. I remember, I viscerally remember that we're, we started going back to Safeway. Um, so that was my version of the dot-com bubble, which which speaks to a level of privilege, hmm. which is a whole other issue there. But real quick, um, number 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 one, um, Mark, I would I'd love to hear from you to close the loop on this 1930s conversation. You spoke of, you've spoken a lot about like the American dream and how you think that remote work could really fuel this. Like the, the, the term American dream actually comes from 1931. It's actually much more recent than people would think given the mythos there. So what's just your articulation of what the American dream looks like given the opportunities ahead of us, if we have to reformat them given the changing times? Yeah. So look, I think the American dream at its core, I think it's quite, it's a quite straightforward idea. And, and in fact, you might not even say it's an American dream. You might say it's a universal dream. Right. Um, and I don't know if this makes me, I don't know if this is a right wing view or left wing view or Marxist materialist or what it is, but I think it's actually pretty straightforward, which is basically it's the ability to basically provide for a family. Um, and it's the ability to provide for a family in particular in three dimensions that people care a lot about and that are very, very important to, to families. One is housing, um, to be able to have a good house right in a, in a good place. Um, uh, second is education, um, to be able to basically have your kids be able to have a higher level of education and greater, you know, opportunities than, than you yourself had. Um, and then third is healthcare, um, you know, to be able to actually get, you know, have you and your kids and your family get taken care of when, when they get sick. And, you know, in, in a sense, like those are, that's such a reductionist definition that it's like, you know, some people would immediately say like, is that it? Like, and, and you could have an argument that says, no, no, you need a lot more than life to that. We, we could talk about that, but. I find that to be a very interesting kind of definition because it's it's very straightforward. Um, and then it makes very clear the nature, like the underlying nature, the profoundness of the underlying problem that we have. And the problem that we have is the, uh, you know, I just named, like, if you asked me to rank order, like the three like industries in America that are like the most like screwed up and dysfunctional and where everything is going in the wrong direction, it's housing, it's education and it's healthcare. Right. And so it's like the three most important things to having what you, you know, call it American dream, call it sort of a middle class life, call it the ability to have family formation, like whatever you want to call it. Like housing, like is a in this country, we we have decided to just have it be a total disaster. Um, you know, I said I said earlier, it's like we 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 can build lots of housing in places nobody wants to go to. We can we cannot build basically any housing in the places where people want to live. You know, there there are studies that show there are as many as two million housing units in northern, in the San Francisco Bay Area. Like yeah, this the uh, uh, the city of San Francisco has authorized six thousand new housing units for all of this year. Um, like it, it just this this just giant absurd disconnect. Um, and then you know education, you know well well chronicled problems in education these days, both K through you know K through twelve and 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 college. Um, and you know we they all seem you know all seems to be going backwards. And then healthcare. You know, healthcare is now, as you guys know, healthcare is now up to a fifth of GDP. Yep. Um, you know, outcomes don't seem to move, but like spending keeps escalating. Um, you know, at at current trends continuing, healthcare is going to go from a fifth of GDP to a fourth to a third to half. <laughs> Everybody wants to consume it. Nobody wants to pay for it. Um, and so, you know, and they, like these are these are giant industries. Um, you know, they 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 for the most part do not harness technological change in a positive way. For the most part, you know, prices rise into perpetuity. Um, you know, if, if, if current trends continue, a four-year college degree is going to cost a million dollars. 
right? And a, and a, and a flat screen TV that covers your entire wall. And it's like, you know, whatever, you know, a thousand K definition is going to cost like a hundred bucks. Mm-hmm. And it, it, you know, it kind of seems like maybe it should be the other way around. <laughs> right? like, I take which, that which one's, <laughs> like, which one's more important. Right. But yet like to, this goes right back to where we started, which is the, the way that we've designed our systems and our economy and our regulatory regulatory framework and government action, all these things is to basically generate dysfunctional outcomes in the three things people care about the most. And so I guess I would say like, I could believe that you could have higher aspirations for an American dream, but like, boy, it, it might be pretty good to like fix those three uh, to start with. Um, by the way, I uh, take this to, to the political for a second. Like I, in my view, this is what's driving to, to this. Th- in my view, this is the ultimate answer to the WTF happened in 2015, um, which is basically if you put family formation and housing, education, and healthcare out of range of ordinary people, uh, you know, leftists are going to go super left um, and they're just going to want the government to provide these things. And rightists are going to go super right. And they're going to want to break up the government and just like have mm-hmm. the, like the, you know, market markets be able to work a lot better or, or the rightists are going to come all the way around and just want the government to do it. Right. And complete the horseshoe. Uh, and so I, I think, I think, I think basically we've wired this system to make ordinary people so frustrated that they basically think they have no choice, but to go to more radical politics. If, if you wanted to reduce political polarization, I think this is also what you would do is you, you would fix those three, those three sectors. You know, we, we've started to nibble away at them. It, it's like the other sectors we talked about. It's like nuclear power. It's like it's hard. Like education is not an easy thing to solve. We're trying. We're, do, we're doing some things. We have a big push in healthcare. Uh, we have a few things we're doing in real estate. But you know, th- those those would be the three sectors that th- those three sectors and probably energy would be the, the 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 ones that we could really bear down on and and actually really improve people's lives. That is Absolutely. a great, great place to end things. Mark, thank you. This is Retour to Force. Thank you for uh, joining us on the realignment. It was a Good. great awesome. pleasure, Mark. Great thank to be you. with you guys. Appreciate it.